Heathrow Airport welcome the Gurkhas this evening. New recruits to the British Army arrived from Nepal to begin their training in North Yorkshire. But relations between Britain and Gurkha soldiers have soured recently because of arguments over pensions and conditions of service. There are also questions about whether it is politically incorrect to employ foreign mercenaries. After all, the origins lie in the heyday of British imperial rule in India. Our special correspondent, Sue Lloyd Roberts, has this report from the remote Himalayan kingdom where the soldiers come from. Dawn in central Nepal, the foothills of the Himalayas. In the village of Kilang, Rosh Mayan Gurung is packing for her son's journey, which she believes is the most important of his life. 19-year-old Cher is going to the British army camp in Pokhara in his bid to become a British Gurkha. <laughs> to the outsider, it's noticeable that the most prosperous homes in the village belong to former Gurkha soldiers. Hence the enthusiasm for the army job and the weight of family expectations. I joined Sher and a friend on the two-day journey from the village to the army base. It's because these young men are used to nipping up and down the mountains they live in before breakfast that they've become renowned for their strength and resilience. Those of us who try and keep up with them usually come a cropper. They told me that eight young men from their village had applied when the recruiting process began back in September and only the two of them were chosen for the final hurdle. My father and grandfather and even before that my family went to war. They fought in the First and Second World Wars. Even if they were fighting for other countries, they were proud to be Gurkha soldiers, and I too will fight to make sure the Gurkha name remains famous. Cher later confides that he probably won't dare go back if he gets turned down. There have even been cases of suicide among young men who are rejected. At this stage, there's no doubt in his mind that he wants to join the British Army but he could become disillusioned when he learns that Britain is being accused by some Gurkhas of exploitation. The regiment of plucky little brown men, as the British Saab would call the Gurkhas in less politically correct times, is famous for its resistance against the Japanese in the Second World War and is one of the most decorated in the British Army. It was their fearsome reputation which is said to have brought about the speedy surrender of Argentine troops in the Falklands. Okay, make all of the More recently, Britain's mercenaries have been used on peacekeeping activities in East Timor. And in Kosovo, the only British fatalities during the intervention were two members of the Gurkha regiment killed while removing a bomb to safety. The Gurkhas ex-servicemen's organization, Gizo, claim their sacrifice for the British over two centuries deserves better recognition. There are men here who've served in Hong Kong, Brunei, Belize, Malaysia, Canada, and several have Gulf War campaign medals. The president says they want their just reward. I asked the group about their grievances and was taken aback by the fury of the response. The old idealisms no longer work. We are hungry, we can't buy clothes, we can't educate our children. What justice is there in a situation where our pension won't even let us buy a sack of rice? Where are our human rights? When did the Gurkhas ever get human rights from the British? The British keep claiming that they are honest people. So why can't they be honest in their dealings with us? Albeit prompted by an indignant campaign by a British tabloid newspaper, the current British government would argue that they are being honest, indeed generous in their dealings with Britain's mercenary soldiers and their families. Asanta Rai, the widow whose husband was killed in Kosovo, has received a death-in-service payout of £54,000. That's the same as a widow would receive in Britain. And in Nepal, the cost of living is estimated at £170 a year. In Nepalese terms, Asanta Rai is a millionaireess, and she says she feels sorry for her British counterpart. Two 
I believe that the level of compensation that a widow in Nepal and in Britain should receive should be in accordance with their individual standard of living. I agree that my living costs are low, but they will increase as the children get older. There will be school fees and so on. All Gurkhas, like all better-off Nepalis, expect to send their children to private schools. The British government has recently doubled the pension for the soldiers from Nepal, which means a former Gurkha should have no problem in sending his children to private school with plenty of money left over. But it's not enough, say the Veterans Association. They have four demands for the British Army. Free education for their children, guaranteed jobs for their children, the right to live in the UK, and the same pension as a British soldier. The protesting Gurkha's main political ally is the leader of the Nepalese Communist Party, Marxist-Leninist branch, who invited me to his home, one of the biggest townhouses in Kathmandu. If you look at it from a political point of view, it's not a good thing for the citizens of one sovereign independent country to serve in the army of another sovereign country. This has been going on for 200 years now and it is time to stop. We want bilateral talks between the Nepalese and British government to bring about a decent end to the practice and for all Gurkhas to retire with pensions equal to a British soldier. Back at the Gurkha army camp, a very different atmosphere prevails, more colonial than communist. While the would-be recruits are trying to win favour with the British officer class, the British officers themselves argue that the numbers here are the true indication of the continuing enthusiasm for this military tradition, however outdated it might appear to others. 27,000 young men applied to join the Gurkhas this year for only 229 places. And there's their willingness to undertake a series of physical and mental tests during the elimination process, which takes weeks. Three, two, one, go! The most grueling of which is the Doka race, which involves running up a hill with 35 kilos of stones on your back. Complaints about retirement terms don't appear to deter these young men. So how does the colonel in charge account for the contrast between the enthusiasm here at the base and the fury of Gizo, the Gurkha Veterans Organization? I think if you, if you talk to the soldiers concerned and, and the serving uh, soldiers and officers, by and large they will dissociate themselves from Gizo completely. Um, I think it's only when they come back to Nepal, um, the conditions of serving, uh, or sorry, living in Nepal is such that there's quite a lot of pressure put on the ex-servicemen, uh, whereas the serving soldiers, um, I think they, they would like to disavow themselves of any knowledge of, of Gizo. Pressure from whom? The Gizo members themselves. Um, they can put pressure on family and that sort of thing. Sher Garung has got through the basic fitness and literacy tests. He now has to prove that he's got what it takes for the British Army. For him, the humiliating prospect of returning to his village as a British Gurkha reject is receding. While the would-be Gurkha recruits are put through their paces, resentment about pension and benefits couldn't be further from the minds of the families they leave behind. Here they wait anxiously for news of success or failure, which for them is the difference between family triumph or tragedy. The news has arrived, Cher has got through. The family honour is preserved and the entire village is promised greater prosperity. His proud father leads the celebrations that go on into the night. For the time being, and up here in the hills at least, any remaining quarrels with the British government are irrelevant.